Well, good Ready to go. You are, yeah. yeah. Um, welcome to the North East Corner, Richard Lockhead. This is episode 73. Um, you're our local MSP. Um, how are you, first and foremost? I'm good, thanks. Yeah. yeah. It's good to meet you both and... 73 episodes. I'll have to listen yeah. to our 72. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time um, coming this. We've had a, a few postponements and that just with uh, life getting in the way. But uh, I guess I kind of wanted to start this off personally is before we get into the likes of independence and UK politics, the kind of uh, wacky races episode that's turned into over the last couple of years. I want to get to know a little bit about you. So from the kind of like amateur research that I've done, um, you're a native of Paisley. Um, but you've been uh, an MSP in one way or another in the North East since the original Scottish Parliament opening in 1999. So can you tell us a bit of the story of how you got into politics and basically how you got from Paisley to the North East is now what you call home? Yeah. So the only time I ever admit to being born in Paisley is when I'm actually speaking in Paisley. <laughs> because I was literally only born in Paisley. <laughs> Within 48 hours, or give or take, I was uh, taken home. Uh, to Clarkson, the south side of Glasgow, which is not far from Paisley. So that's actually where I was raised. Um, and I left Glasgow when I was a, a teenager. Uh, well, no, maybe 20 years of age, actually, 1920, to go to university in Stirling. Kind of never went back and spent a large part of my life uh, in the northeast of Scotland. And uh, so my, my story is I joined the SNP at school. Yep. Uh, me and my friends used to argue about politics in the common room at secondary school. <laughs> And they said that they had a Church of Scotland minister who came round their house, who spent more time talking about the SNP than perhaps what he was supposed to be talking about on behalf of the church. So we had a contact and discovered there was this party called the SNP that believes in independence. Um, but to talk about my own backgrounds, uh, that's how I came into the SNP, but that's that's where I'm from originally, it's Clarks in, in the south side of Glasgow. Um, so you've this is your fourth term in Murray. Uh, the last election was 2021. I wanted to ask you about that because obviously when you're out campaigning and that usually it would be door to door and that, but we were in unprecedented times at that period of time, obviously in the midst of the pandemic. What, I mean, this might sound a little rhetorical question, but what was different about that kind of campaign trail and that whole experience leading up to that? The last general election was really pretty weird and quite challenging because I'm a people person. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I got involved in politics was not only because of uh, the vision and the fact that I wanted you know, Scotland to be independent and uh, to deliver a better country for, for people and future generations and all, all these issues. But I just enjoy speaking to people. And if you're not a people person, you really shouldn't be in politics. But I am absolutely, of course, fascinated by some people <laughs> involved in politics are perhaps not people people. Uh, but <laughs> the last election was weird because I couldn't get out the doors as much as possible and go to the usual community events and run the kind of campaign where I just meet as many people as possible and say hello to them and have a chat. So that was really challenging because that's what I'm best at and what I thrive at. But of course, it was the one thing that was uh, the most curtailed in the last general election campaign because of the, the pandemic. So I ended up using social media a lot more than ever before. Yeah. And I latterly was able to go out and meet people, I think, in the last sort of you know few days, few weeks of the campaign. Um, but... Uh, not as much as usual. And of course, during COVID, I started a weekly Facebook Live and that um, went down really well with the local population and, and voters uh, because people were struggling for answers about COVID. So I decided at seven o'clock every Thursday, I'll do a Facebook Live and just take people's questions. And it ended up being pretty popular <laughs> and quite innovative. So I was looking for new ways to reach out to people. But that was probably prior to the actual official election campaign, but it was just an indication of how we had to do things differently during COVID. Yeah. Um, you've been an original member of the Scottish Parliament since the inaugural uh, 1999. Um, how much has uh, Parliament changed in the last 24 years? Yeah, I'm one of the dwindling gang of 99 members, and it makes me feel quite old just thinking about that <laughs> and the fact that it's 23, 24 years. Uh, is, does the Parliament's changed dramatically over that period of time? Um, and, of course, for the first eight years I was in Parliament, we were in opposition. And then since then, we've been in government, so I've seen it from both sides. But the personalities have changed, the issues we're debating have changed, um, the, the quality's changed, it's improved dramatically. Um, you know, I remember when we were first elected in 99, 
uh, that you know everyone said, oh, the real parliaments in Westminster, the House of Commons. This is a, you know, this is just the amateurs. This is the second best, second class parliament in Edinburgh. And of course, we always argued against that. But nowadays, of course. There's no way anyone would argue that. They'd argue exactly the opposite. <laughs> Look at shenanigans in Westminster and the quality of people even at higher echelons of politics in Westminster, like prime ministers. You know, the quality has deteriorated dramatically down there. But the parliament's got more mature in Scotland and it's improved in terms of quality of debates and, and so on and so forth. Although politics is quite toxic just now, so maybe they don't always see that or hear it. But overall, I think parliament's improved and the sort of issues have changed dramatically. You know, we're talking about climate change and net zero and greening the economy and that, amongst several other issues, you know, weren't even spoken about back in 99 to any great degree. Mm. So the, the agenda's changed dramatically as well. Yeah. So you've held a fair few roles in, the, I guess, the Cabinet, you would say, as well. Um, so you've been Rural Affairs, Environment Secretary, Further Education, Higher Education, Science, Trust Transition, Employment and Fair Work. And I would add personally to that as well, which might not be as a prestigious of an award. Uh, it might be the same for you here, Lee. But you are the only political option that I voted for that has went on to win. So <laughs> another, another feather in your cap there. Um, well, thank you for support. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously that goes on top of like being an, uh, an MSP. Like how... How busy does that make you? Do you enjoy uh, keeping occupied in that and the roles uh, that you've uh, held over the years as well? Well, I've been totally blessed with my political career and the constituency I represent. Now, I've been in Parliament since 99, but I've been in government since 2007. And, you know, if you'd said to me many years ago that I would even be in government at all, never mind since uh, 2007 until now with a, a short 18-month break in between... Um, I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, so I was in cabinet for nine years, and you know that that was pretty exhausting. I was uh, cabinet secretary for rural affairs. It was the first SNP cabinet. We were elected as a, a minority government in two thousand and seven. So we were working like Trojans because we thought we might only be in power for a few months. We thought the other parties were going to bring us down, um, and it was quite stressful. Uh, but of course, the, the cabinet was also much smaller back then. I think there was only maybe six members plus the First Minister, which is about half the size of now, I think. And, you know, I was totally bowled over to be asked to join Cabinet, uh, as I said, with responsibility for rural affairs and the environment as well. Uh, so life was unbelievable through that nine years in particular. That was seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And I always remember being sworn in at the Court of Session. The Cabinet members get sworn in at the Court of Session um, because you're the official government. And, you know, I just remember getting sworn in there. And then we were briefed afterwards about what it meant to be in the cabinet. And you were told, of course, that every word you utter becomes government policy because you are the living, breathing embodiment of government, yeah. the cabinet members. So it's quite, you know, <laughs> it's quite strange getting used to that. And that's why, yes, politicians do have to be careful about what they say. But if you are uh, on the cabinet, you have to be particularly careful about what you say because um, you are speaking behalf of the government uh, at all times. And... Uh, so that nine years was particularly busy. And as you said, I've been reappointed to various posts since then. So life is hectic. Um, maybe not quite the intensity of when you're on cabinet, mm. but still you, you fill that gap with other work. Um, and yeah, life continues to be pretty hectic. The, um, the MP of uh, Murray is complete opposite to yourself. Um, how do you um, differentiate between yourselves? Because obviously you have to work together for the good of Murray, um, but you are sit on different uh, political spectrums. Um, how how do well do you get on with Douglas? Um, do you do you see eye eye on a lot of things, or is it just for the greater good? Maybe not personal agreements. Well, you know Douglas um, Ross is uh, he's elected. He's elected as the the member of parliament for for Murray in Westminster and also as an MSP for the Highlands and Islands of Scotland uh, as well, a regional MSP. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure you'll find us having a pint together at the bar at Muckle <laughs> and Elgin or, or anywhere else in Murray, but um, and our values and approach to politics couldn't be di more different. Yeah. Um, and of course, we're in difficult political parties as well, but I think it's more than just being in different political parties. I think our our, our values and, and approach to things are, are completely different and people can make up their minds of, as to what they prefer. <laughs> um, but of course we work together, you know, for, for Murray. Uh, we've got a job to do and, 
you know, there are issues like the campaign to restore the maternity services at Dr Gray's or other issues that people come to us with across the, the constituency where they expect their elected representatives to work together and we do that where, where it's possible. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously we've got huge differences. <laughs> so just to kind of follow up on that, and it's more like a, a broad question probably about the area and the, the Conservative Party, I guess. In 2017, that's when Douglas was uh, elected and I was quite frankly shocked that this area voted Conservative and a lot of the times that I do find myself almost kind of fascinated that the MSP for this area is the Scottish National Party and the MP is Conservative, which are two polar opposites of the political spectrum. What do you think, just kind of transitioning into independence now as well, what do you think Murray's kind of view on the independence question is at the moment? Because obviously in 2014, I think the swing was, uh, I do have the uh, figures, 42% yes and 57% no. Where do you think, do you think that's changed over uh, from then till now? Yeah, I think it's changed dramatically. I think both on independence and Brexit, Murray's changed. I think compared to many constituencies in Scotland, Murray will still be quite narrow in terms of, you know, it'll be quite close between um, whether it's EU membership and Brexit or whether it's independence and union. But I think it has changed since 2017 and since, uh, you know, the last couple of years in particular, a lot of the opinion polls show that, that show that independence is much higher now, if not a majority in, in, in Murray, and that more people now by far want to be in Europe in Murray than mm -hmm. what the situation was before. So I'm confident that we will do well in Murray in an independence referendum and in terms of returning to the EU, I think we get majority support in Murray as well. Uh, that's because Murray has been particularly hard hit by Brexit, mm -hmm. yes. which is ironic given that uh, this area was so narrow, mm -hmm. but we did vote to remain. And, you know, we can't pretend this area voted for Brexit, but some people try and pretend yeah. this area voted Remain. And, uh, but it's ironic that so many people did vote for Brexit, but yet this is one of the areas hardest hit by Brexit. So I think many people have uh, regretted how they voted. Mm -hmm. Now, Murray is quite unique in some ways, but it's also got a lot in common with the neighbouring constituencies. So in 2017, there was two or three seats that went for uh, quite a big vote for Brexit, and also went Conservative. And um, so it wasn't just Murray, it was neighbouring seats as well. But Murray in itself also has some unique characteristics, I think, that makes, uh, uh, you know, you have to take into account when you're thinking about the, the, the political profile of the area. I mean, obviously you've got the RAF, you've got quite an ageing population. Uh, and, you know, the rural issues, the coastal heritage. So there's you know, different social economic factors there that make Murray quite unique compared to some other areas. Mm -hmm. So it can be a bit unpredictable, I guess, at times, as we found out. Absolutely. Um, we'll kind of go back to the RAF there a little bit. Um, we've seen in your time um, the ability to keep the, the bases in Murray and things like that. Would you that say part of that campaign would be one of your biggest achievements in Murray, to keep so many jobs mm -hmm. within the area? Um, or would you say think there's something bigger that, that you've done since in, in, in your time? Well, I'm very proud of many of the campaigns I've been involved in as MSP over the years, uh, much of which, or most of which have, I think, been quite successful and had good outcomes. Obviously, we don't win every campaign. Uh, the Save the Base campaign in 2010, uh, 2011 time was... Obviously, a huge campaign. It was a community-led campaign. We'd never seen anything like it before, and I'm not sure we'll see anything like it again. Uh, hopefully, we don't have to fight for the base again. Um, so it was really, you know, part of the area's uh, folklore now. Yeah. That, that community-led campaign with the march. It was obviously a huge national story. Um, and it is ironic, of course, given all the ongoing debates about the future of the base. You know, what will happen with the base, with independence. When the only time I've ever had to campaign to save it, is, you know, it was under the Conservative UK government, government tried to <laughs> you know, what, uh, 13 years ago. And now it's Scotland's only operational RAF base. So it's always evolving, it's always changing. Uh, the uses of the base just now and the, the aircraft that are operating out of there are different to what it was, you know, 10 years ago. And that was different to what that was back then to 20 years before that. So it's always changing the number of employees there uh, and its role. 
But, you know, I think its future's now pretty secure, especially now it's given it's the only operational base in Scotland. But yeah, it was an amazing experience to speak at that rally, the, the march, um, you know, the rest of the campaign. Uh, and of course, that whole campaign was uh, in, in the national spotlight. You know, it was a national yeah. story. So you mentioned Brexit. Obviously, I think between the first in independence referendum and the one if and when the next one comes is probably the biggest thing that's happened in between them. I actually watched an interview that you did leading up to the 2014 referendum in where they asked if it was a no vote what you thought um, would be the case. And you said that you thought people would regret it within a year to two year period. And you couldn't have predicted it any better, really, because within 18 months, we had the European Union referendum um the majority uh, of the UK, I guess you would say at the time, voted leave. The entirety of Scotland, if we're looking at a constituency and how things work in the polling and that, voted remain, but was then made to uh, get taken out of the European (laughs) Union. Yeah, exactly. Um, And then there was this dragged on process for three, four years of a stalemate until it was meant to be 2019. And then the, the pandemic happened. And then there was the election as well before that. And it was like a deadline. It was like every October, it was like it's happening this time. And then officially, I guess it happened on Christmas Eve 2020 when Johnson had that thing. And he was like, we've got the fish, time for the sprouts or, or whatever. <laughs> but, um, uh, just speaking to like family members and that, they're working like retail, for example. Like they, they say to me all the time, ever since that speech was given of when it was actually that, you know, we're out of the European Union now, there's not been like a full stock of shelves like since, since that's happened. What, what kind of destructive legacy do you think Brexit is, is having overall and what it will we'll leave if we continue to be out of this? I think Brexit's been disastrous for households and businesses in Murray. It's been disastrous for the region. And where do you, you begin? I mean, there's so many different reasons. I mean, we were lied to during the yeah. campaign and we had a bunch of populist politicians who looked for scapegoats and tried to pretend there'd be a flood of, you know, Syrian refugees coming into Scotland or UK if we didn't leave Europe and all that total, utter nonsense. And we were just lied to. And we were promised everything would be better. We promised the energy would be cheaper, that food would be cheaper. You know, the list goes on and on and on. And that's because over the last 10 years or so, we've seen these right-wing populist politicians... Mm. And it's a phenomenon, not just in this country, but, you know, throughout the UK and we've seen in America, obviously, with Donald Trump rising to the top. And they cause damage because they lead people up garden paths. They use scapegoats to try and get people to vote for them by targeting scapegoats and using hate and so on. And that's what we had with the the, the EU referendum. We had, unfortunately, um, some politicians who didn't like immigrants, who didn't like Europe, uh, don't like people who are poor and they wanted to create this UK elite that got all the money and, you know, this kind of right-wing nationalism, um, you know, and sail off into the sunset singing Rule Britannia. Mm-hmm. And Scotland didn't vote for that. Murray didn't vote for that. But the rest of the UK voted for that, so we got Brexit. The damage to this area is exports. Local businesses have spent an absolute fortune, millions and millions of pounds that could have gone on to creating more jobs or whatever, trying to deal with the bureaucracy around Brexit, trying to deal with um, how to keep their exports going uh, and uh, all these kinds of things. We've lost European funding to this area. Uh, Murray, as part of the Highlands and Islands, got a lot of European funding. Uh, That's all gone. We were promised that was going to be replaced. We're getting a lot less now. And, of course, even levelling up funding doesn't come to Murray that uh, Boris Johnson promised. Uh, we have no freedom of movement. So we've got labour shortages locally. A lot of our hospitality sectors and food sectors depended on people coming from the EU to work in our part of the world. Um, and, you know, that's been hit hard as well. Um, we've got hotels that can't uh, open or restaurants to the same degree because you can't find staff. And, you know, that's another hit. We've got ordinary people who are... Um, paying more for goods and services than they did before, yeah. that have to wait in long queues from going mm-hmm. through airports that they didn't do before. They've seen the value of the pound come down as well, so they spend more money going abroad, uh, and that list goes on and on and on as well. So I, I don't know where to you know end. Yeah. I could take up your whole podcast talking about the damage of Brexit, but the key point is that Scotland and Murray did not vote for this, mm-hmm. and that's a democratic um, outrage. 
I think it's fair to say we're still waiting for that. Is it three hundred and fifty million a year to the NHS? That yes, was on that bus. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. At the end of a bus. Does it frustrate you knowing how wealthy and independent Scotland could be? Absolutely, totally frustrating. I joined the SNP when I was a teenager in the days of Margaret Thatcher because I saw all the damage being done to Scotland and I thought, we've got the human resources and the natural resources to make a go of this and be as successful, if not more successful, than many other countries we can compare ourselves to. Not necessarily going to be better than anyone, but just the same as. And instead, what we're seeing is our resources been bled out of Scotland, a lack of decision-making locally, which meant bad decisions were taken. We saw back then how Scotland was used as a guinea pig for the poll tax, um, you know, imposed by a government that Scotland didn't vote for. At one point in the late 80s, every Tory MP was voted out of Scotland. Uh, yet all the policies still were implemented here. Um, so that's why, that's why I joined the SNP. And now, if anything, I'm even more frustrated. <laughs> you know, we sit here in one of the world's most energy-rich countries, as an example, and our people can't afford to heat their homes. Mm. We don't have control of energy policy in Scotland. We don't have control of the tax and fiscal regime around uh, energy and other areas in Scotland. Um, so we can make money out of our energy resources in the way we choose to do so um, and how we invest that afterwards. So that's just one example, an energy-rich country where people can't afford to heat their homes. So I'm very frustrated that a resource-rich country like Scotland, and, in, and of course here in Murray and Speyside, We've got the biggest food and drink sector in the whole of the UK, which is Scotch whiskey. Mm -hmm. About 60%, up to 60% of Scotch whiskey uh, comes from Speyside. And uh, most of those distilleries are based in my money constituency. Speyside goes beyond my boundary, but most of it's my boundary. And, you know, that's a massive sector of what was around £5 billion now. And we don't have any control over the income from that either or how to, to manage that going forward. Um, yet... Yeah, you know, we could do some money to repair our local roads that the whiskey lorries use, for instance. So, yeah, I mean, you could go on and on about the amount of resources we've got. Yeah. And so to me, independence, though, is not just about what we inherit from the union. It's about what you can build afterwards. Yeah, 100%. And that's why, again, frustrated the political debate. The chairman says, oh, look at the profit and loss sheet of Scotland. We can't afford to be independent. And my argument to that is that's under the union. Yeah. yeah. This is what the union's yeah. done. This is what the union's done in terms of how it manages Scotland. <laughs> You're looking at the profit and loss account of the union. If we're not performing economically as well as we should, it's because the union is not putting Scotland as a priority. The southeast of England's, you know, overheating as an economy because it serves the southeast of Scotland, uh, southeast of England. Uh, but you know, so you're looking at this. You can't judge the status quo and then say that's what the future will hold with independence. I suppose that like kind of aligns with the fear-mongering around independence or the, that the other side is trying to put towards independence. Um, and the First Minister actually brought up uh, the SNP conference back in November, I believe it was, where she was talking about all the things that were brought up in the 20, lead up to 2014 of the country will be bankrupt and all this has happened anyway. And it's happened on a grander scale than though anyone would have predicted under obviously the the um, the absolute Looney Tunes episode that's happened in the last six months down in Westminster. Yeah, I mean... It's striking how politics has been so volatile and to the degree quite toxic over the last, uh, I don't know, 10 years, give or take, maybe a wee bit longer. Um, obviously had the bank crash in 2008, 2009, and maybe since then things have been quite divisive um, because when things are tough, people take extreme positions sometimes. And, you know, the bank crash, Brexit... The election of someone like Boris Johnson. We used to laugh at the idea of someone like Boris yeah. Johnson being <laughs> Prime Minister. Um, but, you know, these things have all come to pass. Yeah. Uh, and the, 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 the disruption and the, the impact of all these events has been phenomenal. And, you know, now we're the only country out of the industrialised world to be, have a declining economy in 2023. I mean, Britain... Britain, you know, the only country to go into decline in 2023, according to the, the IMF. It's astonishing. I saw a graph of 30 industrialised countries. And Britain was number 30, mm -hmm. and it was the only one going into decline. That was at the IMF. Um, so, you know, that's what's happened. And you just have to look at the, the crazy decisions and, and the out-of-touch um quite eccentric yeah. conservative politicians <laughs> that are running our country for the last few years. Don't worry, we'll, we'll get on to that in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I suppose it, it's another thing that kind of... Do, do you think Brexit... I'll, I'll move on from Brexit after this. Do you think Brexit was the biggest political mistake ever made in this country? Well, in Scotland, I think the biggest political mistake ever made was voting no in 2014. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to Scottish independence. Because uh, I think much of that would have been avoided and we'd have spent the subsequent 10 years building Scotland up as opposed to taking us further down um, if we'd voted yes in 2014. But that's by the by, that's history and the, the people had their say and that's, that's democracy. Uh, so yeah, of course, Brexit's I mean, let's say the, the second biggest mistake yes. in the last 10 years <laughs> or my lifetime. So uh, we spoke to Paul Jameson, the silent clansman, he says that he's, he's had experiences with you uh, over his time and he's a massive uh, campaigner for the, the independence movement. Um, and I posed this question to him as well. So when we talk about independence, we usually have like two sides like, that are probably not going to change their mind in the unionist movement and the independence movement. But in my opinion, and this is you know probably just an assumption, I think the most important pro uh, important vote is going to be the moderates or the undecided, I guess you would call it. How, how did the Scottish government approach that in convincing those people that independence is the right way forward? Yeah, it's a very good question. And I think there is a recognition that, you know, the next independence referendum, we're all going to be competing for a small part of the population because there'll be a lot of people who believe in the union who, as you say, won't change their minds. And likewise, there'll be people who want independence who won't easily change their minds. So I don't know that uh, 10 or 20% of people in the middle will be the battlegrounds. And we have to find ways to reach out to them. Um, I think it will be down to vision. Um, I think uh, towards the end of the campaign in 2014, the the positivity and the vision of the independence campaign was winning. And, and then, of course, the British establishment, literally in the last week or so of the campaign, brought out its big guns with fear-mongering, and that got the no campaign over the line. Um, you know, had the result been a week before that, we might have won the 2014 referendum. It just peaked too early, it seems. But So we have to reach out to these people, and that's with vision, and, of course, addressing you know, jobs and livelihoods um, and trying to give people confidence just to make that, that, that leap. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of got a hypothetical question for you that a family member told me to pose. Uh -huh. So they work in a retail store that's actually an English company, so her kind of question was, if we became an independent country, obviously there's been um, plans set out into maybe join the things like the single market and obviously the European Union and stuff like that. But if she would that English company still be able to operate in an independent Scotland? And if that was the case, would like their stock, obviously coming from a nation that is dealing outside of the European Union, still be able to come in and that? So I guess that's more like a job security, but also in relation to the EU and stuff like that as well. Yeah. So. There's, there's two points to make there. Firstly, is that retailers work in many different countries. This is not just retailers that work in Scotland and England or mm -hmm. Scotland and the rest of the UK. You know, Tesco or whichever retail you want to pick. Uh, obviously, Aldi's and, you know, um, the other internationally owned ones, they work in different jurisdictions and across Europe. They're used to this. And they've continued to work in... Uh, the UK or operate in the UK even though the UK is out of Europe so they're used to working in countries that are in Europe and out of Europe so um, I don't see any change whatsoever to these companies uh, if anything we'll create more jobs in Scotland because we'll get more headquarters created here uh, you know we will um, have that magnet effect that other capital cities have or, ca or countries that are independent but that have statehood so we'll create more jobs in that area and in terms of Scotland going back into Europe, if the rest of the UK remains outside of Europe, then we will have to negotiate with um, the European Union and the UK to make sure we have that ease of flow uh, of goods and services. So any checks at the border would be minimal, electronic. Um, and, you know, ironically, of course, we've got a situation just now with Northern Ireland, where Northern Ireland's been given the best of both worlds. So it's been given the benefits of EU membership through the island the, the island of Ireland and the arrangements there but of course it's part of the UK which is outside of Europe and they've come up with bespoke arrangements to give Northern Ireland the best of both worlds so we can you know I think in Scotland's situation a solution will be found because we're all part of the same island um, I think we have to have that recognised yeah 
Um, we've recently seen a, an SNP leader change down in Westminster. Um, do you do you think this is a good change? Obviously, a, a lot of people like Ian Blackford, um, but we have a song, uh, a s strong leader in Stephen Flynn now, um, with Mary Black as deputy. Um, do, do you think it's a good a good thing? Obviously, we knew Ian wasn't going to be able to stay in the job forever. Um, but do you think this is a, a positive thing to have a stronger voice for Scotland down in Westminster, or do you think are you in agreement with most Scottish? Um, politicians in Westminster that we just need to be away from there altogether? Well, yeah, I mean, preferably we wouldn't have to have this discussion because we wouldn't have uh, any politicians in Westminster because we've been dependent, um, so we'll have to wait for that to happen. But uh, politics is always full of surprises. You know, I was surprised when the Westminster group in Westminster changed its leader. Um, but I'm not part of the Westminster group, so obviously I'm not familiar with all the issues. Um, but, you know, I think... Ian and Stephen are different uh, in terms of their style. So I think Stephen's had quite a big impact with his direct style. Yes. You know, he's, a much, he's got quite a succinct direct style. So I think people quite like that. And, you know, Ian had different qualities. So I'm not going to say who's better or, or worse because I think, firstly, it's too early to judge Stephen because he's only been in the, the position for a few weeks. And uh, But, you know, he's got his strengths and they're coming across. So I think Stephen will be a popular leader of the Westminster group. I know Stephen, I like him. Uh, but likewise, I know Ian Blackford well, and I've known him for years. And he brought a, a gravitas to the position as well and was very successful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's difficult for me to say who's, who's going to be the best of the two. But Stephen's certainly making a positive impact. And you can see that with the UK commentators commenting his good performances at uh, PMQs. So we've asked everyone that we've had on to talk about independence so far this question, and it's just simply, what does an independent Scotland look like through your eyes? So an independent Scotland through my eyes looks like a prosperous country, a more equal society, where we take our environmental limits very seriously and we play to Scotland's strengths. So in terms of creating new green jobs based on green energy and other new technologies... We've got a history of heritage uh, in innovation and science. We're respected throughout the world for our universities and our, our scientific pedigree. So we can build on that. We've got a lot of trust overseas. I think we have a good international standing. And um, I, I think small countries are more flexible. They can adapt more quickly to changing global circumstances or, or regional circumstances. And, you know, they can be fleet of foot. And that's why the Scandinavian countries are so successful. They've got much happier populations. They're more prosperous countries. They've got control of their natural resources. They've got control of their economic decision-making. But they've created a good social compact with their people. So, you know, goods, you're looked after by the state if you need to be looked after. And, uh, you know, I think as a North Northwest European country, we can aspire to that kind of vision as well. So I see Scotland as a good, clean, green country that's prosperous, making the most of its human resources. We've got one of the most educated populations in the world, as well as its natural resources. And I want people to be happier and more self-fulfilled. And we need to tackle inequality in our society to achieve that as well. How, what do you think the road looks like to get into independence now? Because obviously recently we've had the Supreme Court, well, not ruling, but the interpretation of the law that said that the Scottish government couldn't hold a referendum without the UK uh, governments go ahead uh, obviously the the kind of next uh, path that it looked like at the time was a de facto referendum so basically campaigning on a single issue at the next general election do you think that's the route that the Scottish government are going to take so I guess I, I think there's two things we have to do firstly we have to persuade more and more people to support independence mm -hmm. the best thing that would deliver independence is people supporting it we've seen the majority of recent opinion polls showing a majority for independence. Now, it will continue to fluctuate, but it is telling us something that a majority of opinion polls have shown a majority of support for independence. So if we build that up, keep building up, you know, we're maybe 50-odd percent just now, get that higher and higher and higher over the next uh, couple of years or whatever, I think that will play a big part in getting to where we want to get to because it becomes irresistible. And the second point is to force the issue. How do you force the issue when you have a UK government who are refusing to respect the democratic will of the people? Now, that's a difficult position. It's undemocratic, 
but it's where we are. Mm. We've got an aggressive, muscular unionist administration in the current Tory party uh, in, in Westminster and the UK government. So what do we do when they're saying no to a referendum? But the people are saying yes. And that is a difficult position for democracy and for Scotland and for the UK. So we've got to force issues somehow. So we'd much prefer to have a referendum and the UK government to say, we respect the mandate you've got. Let's talk about how we can organise a referendum. They're not doing that at the moment. So we have to force the issue somehow and move the debate forward and turn the dial and rank things up. And I think, you know, therefore that, that means we've got to use a, an election as a de facto referendum, fight on independence and Absolutely. force the issue. The question is, what's the alternative? Exactly. Now, the debate the SNP is having is which election? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it is essentially we've got a conference in March, and there'll be a debate there about tactics and strategy. Um, and we've at the moment got a position of the next election, which is the next Westminster election. But the party will have that debate and debate strategy because obviously there is an alternative of the next Holyrood election. Uh, and, you know, we'll have that debate. Each, in my view, my personal view, each of those, of course, has got its pros and cons. I do think, though, that no, no matter which election we pick as a de facto referendum, if the question's about independence, then people will determine their vote on independence. Mm, yes. That'll create a dynamic in itself. So we do have a debate, and I don't know the answers, I don't pretend to have the answer, as to which is the best environment. Is it Westminster or Holyrood? But... Part of me thinks maybe it doesn't matter because the dynamic of having any election as a de facto referendum in itself will you know, make it about independence and, and people will determine their votes on that basis. You speak about democracy there, so I think it's a good time to maybe switch to the UK kind of <laughs> politics. What, what have you made of the state of democracy in the UK just from the Westminster point of view at the moment? Like, obviously, we had Johnson finally meet his end through all the kind of stuff that he'd been up to over the years and then Lose Trust was then put in place which I kind of almost kind of <laughs> I almost uh, I'm fascinated at how the Conservative Party managed to find someone progressively worse each time that they hire a leader and then Lose Trust thing just I mean it went from zero to 100 in, in, incredibly quick but the kind of point I'm going to make about democracy is Boris then tried to make his way back into government and the thing that scared me is like he nearly he nearly did it in the sense of, I think it was a hundred backers they needed at the time. And I reckon if he had got, I think he was like 30 off of it or something. If he had got that, he would have beat Rishi Sunak in a membership vote again. And then we would have been left with a, a guy that had been thrown out of office for corruption or, or whatever, a couple of months beforehand, then leading the country again within a couple of months. Well, the Tories have debased politics, mm. whichever standard you look at, they've debased it, <laughs> you know, whether it's public standards or democratic standards, they have debased UK politics. And, you know, we could talk forever and have whole podcasts dedicated to the examples they've given. You've just seen in the last, you know, a uh, few weeks more scandals and, you know, you can't keep up. Um, but in the olden days, you know, maybe when I was your own age or whatever, you know, Prime Ministers resigned was a huge issue, a huge story. It was yeah. a democratic event in that it would lead to a general election. But now we've got this small clique of Tory politicians created by Brexit who are running the show for themselves and do their best to ignore the people. So they ain't going to the ballot box. They'll just change whoever's at the top of the party. And that's why we've not had a general election, despite the fact they've changed uh, PM twice just in the last few months. You know, if this was past decades, there would have been a general election. It's, you know, governments would have fallen easily on even just some of the more milder, th milder yeah. things committed by this government in the past. <laughs> governments have just fallen because they've, they've had a bit of, you know, self-respect and democratic duty to go to the country. But now, of course, that doesn't happen. So it's all changed under this current um, bunch. And I'm, I was hearing, actually, I think it was a, a Glasgow councillor saying that it was funny that the people that were in that had power in terms of the markets and that got their way by a change of prime minister but the actual people who were screaming for a general election for like a four-week period were completely and utterly ignored pretty much in terms of the request from it 
Well, exactly. And the fact, I think the point you made earlier on is that just a few hundred, or in case of the Tory membership, a few thousand people are choosing who's running the country. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the electorate's tiny. Yeah. And the, the tens of millions of voters in the UK are not getting a look in. So I'm not surprised the Tories are facing oblivion at the next uh, UK election. Do you feel the drive for independence um, is maintained by the SNP having such a strong leader and such a good politician at the, the head of it? Yeah, well, Nicola Sturgeon is outstanding. She's got huge respect internationally. And clearly she's won her elections in Scotland as well. So she's been given a clear mandate. And, you know, uh, we broke a record at the last election. You know, after so many years in power, the SNP broke records at the last election in terms of the number of votes we got. And, you know, we're only, what, one seat short of a, a majority, one or two seats short of a majority in the Scottish Parliament which is a phenomenal result in a PR system after so many years in power. Um, so I don't think that just talks to how bad the other parties are, <laughs> uh, particularly <laughs> Conservatives, but and Labour, of course, have collapsed in recent years in Scotland. But I think it's a testament to Nicola Sturgeon's leadership. Um, she's a strong female leader, yeah. and she speaks in the heart, and she's got strong principles. And you know, people can contrast that with... She seems well, like a nice person as well. Yeah, and, you know, she's, uh, <coughs> she's a lovely person, but she, she cares deeply. Yeah. And I think people see that. Yeah. Might not disagree with all our policies, uh, might not agree with all our policies, and, you know, no one does agree with everyone's policies, but uh, they can see that she's authentic. Yeah. Do you think that's why she does get such a hard time down in Westminster and the, the media and all that kind of down there, because she is such a strong, powerful leader up here that they almost feel threatened by that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think Nicola, I, I wish I could remember the figure, but she said the other day how many prime ministers she'd <laughs> seen off. <laughs> you know, and it's, geez, well, I've lost count now, but I suppose it must be uh, David Cameron, David Cameron Theresa yeah. May. Um, must be five. Also Ricky Shunak now, yeah. uh, Liz Truss, Boris Johnson. You know? <laughs> so it's quite a few she's seen off in her time as First Minister of Scotland. So no wonder they're, they're, they see her as a threat um, and as a threat to, you know, you know, frustrating their ability to hold on to Scotland. Yeah. Oh, you go next. Uh, yeah, yeah go. Um, we're kind of sticking with UK politics. Um, how much of a kind of lead balloon in your stomach does it see to have a food bank in your own constituency? You were asking me earlier on about how Parliament's changed since 1999. And of course, lots of things have changed since 1999. And I've been representing Murray since 2006. But if you'd said to me in 2006 that we would rely on Murray Food Plus and the food banks we've had, uh, I think since 2010, since the Conservatives came to power in 2010, and austerity was imp imp implemented and the benefits regime was changed and so on, uh, I mean, I believed you because you know, just thought, what? We're one of the richest countries in the world, apparently. Yeah. You know, we keep getting told that Britain's so successful that Scotland should not leave Britain because it's so successful. It's one of the richest countries in the world. But yet, you know, look at what people are going through now and have done for the last few years. And demand is just getting worse or higher, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for for the food bank in, in Murray, not less. No. And now we've got uh, a school bank, mm -hmm. we've got a baby bank. And I really commend all the people behind all these organisations because they're dedicated to helping others. But I'm sure they'd be the first people to say to us they wish they didn't have to have those organisations. Yeah, 100%. I used to work in the third sector and one of the people from the uh, the school bank was saying, I absolutely love my job, but it shouldn't exist. Yeah. So I find it heartbreaking. And, you know, just now I'm speaking to local churches and other organisations that are creating warm spaces yeah. so that people can go and stay hot and don't have to spend money at home heating their homes because they, they can't afford to. And, you know, again... Food banks, warm spaces, warm spaces and energy rich country. Yep. You know, it's really quite difficult to think of many countries in the world that per capita of population have got as much energy resources as we've got. Mm -hmm. But we've got warm spaces now. And as I said, you know, uh, the food banks are apparently one of the richest countries in the world. And if you look at this pattern since the Tories came to power in 2010, it's all happened since then. Yeah. What do you make of the Labour Party over the last 20 years in their? Nosedive decline, really, I guess, especially in Scotland, but obviously at the moment they look like they could be the future power in Westminster, potentially even going into if we have another, uh, when we have another referendum. 
Well, the Labour Party are depending on the pendulum swinging because the Tories are so unpopular. <laughs> uh, I think the Labour Party in Scotland, though, uh, uh, obviously the 2015 election in particular, when they were wiped out, uh, were found out. Mm-hmm. You know, they prioritised getting into Westminster, into power, more than Scotland. And they were found out in 2015, or t- particularly, obviously, in the 2014 independence referendum, when they went the Tories to, Scot- to stop Scotland getting independence. And the people never forgave him for that. Uh, so the Labour Party, as you can see just now, are trying to be very, very careful because they don't want to lose votes in Middle England. Uh, and they want to regain their seats in the north of England. And that's their priority. Mm. Keir Starmer, however much you might like him, and I've got no reason not to like him or you know admire him, but the reality, the cold reality of politics is... Keir Starmer does not wake up in the morning and think, how can I make Scotland a better country? Yes. And, you know, what's what, what, what the issues we can tackle in Scotland? Now, people might argue, oh, he does that as part of wanting that for the whole of the UK. But the point is, we could have, like other countries and other nations, you know, governments that are waking up in the morning and thinking, right, what can we do here to make this country better? Uh, that's our option. And we can do that as a nation. And I suppose it's very condescending with the likes of him and, and shadow cabinet ministers like Lisa Nandy just rule out off the bat like, no, there's not going to be another independence referendum when they're not even in power. They can't even beat this shambles of a government that's been there for 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not exactly, exactly great competition. Yeah, I guess they just don't want to be in the hot seat yeah. when Scotland gets independence. <laughs> you know, and it's, uh, but I just wish they'd put their democratic principles first. Yeah. And to be fair, other Labour leaders have done that. But the current Labour leaders are not doing that. And I don't think that'll do them any favours in Scotland. No, absolutely not. Um, I'm going to kind of take us back to more kind of local issues again. Um, keep mum. Um, it's something that's actually personally affected me twice. Um, I've lost a nephew through um, lack of maternity services. And my son was almost born in a lay-by. Um, so it's just, just kind of asking what, what's kind of been done to uh, help with the maternity services within Murray. Um, just now because we know that um, there's a lot of back and forth between Aberdeen and Dr Gray's and things um, is there would there any, ever be any scope to have things move to NHS Highland due to the kind of location where things you know there, there's a lot that seems to be a, a lot of people have got good ideas but nothing seems to be kind of nobody seems to be correlating these ideas and making things happen you know yeah well first of all I'm sorry to hear about your own experience and what you've been through because I can, I can imagine that'd be so traumatic um, and it's a huge issue you know obviously in the local community not just for patient care but also for the economy as well we need young families to want to live here because they think they can have their children at a local hospital so it's an economic issue as much, you know, also obviously as a, an issue for patient care it's been one of the hardest if not the hardest issue I've dealt with since being MSP because dealing with NHS Grampian has been really really challenging uh, and I do think finally we do have some movement. We've now got a plan, and there's no doubt that we've now got a project team at NHS Grampian set up to implement that plan. So we have made a step forward, and I think Keep Mum have played an amazing job uh, with their campaigning and with the community support. And I've obviously supported them since day one. So we have to keep the NHS Grampian's feet to the fire in this. Because we've got the plan finally, we've got a commitment to finance it by the Scottish Government. And now it's going to take two or three years to actually get to where we were before. So as you say, we need to see delivery of this plan. Forgive the pun. And uh, I'm hoping, you know, um, touch wood, that finally we're going to get that movement and things are going to happen quickly. We've had NHS Grampian letting uh, Murray down uh, to Aberdeen-focused not listening to people, not recognising uh, just how serious this issue is. And um, as I said before, the late, the newest chief executive at NHS Grampian now says she's totally committed to getting this service restored. Okay. So there is a there is a plan with milestones, and the plan is that by the end of 2026, we're restored to the full service we had before. Indeed, even better than the service we had before. Fantastic. We're never going to be in a position where all babies are born in Murray, because that was never the position previously. Clearly, babies that need special specialist care will have to go to Aberdeen. Um, but you asked about the use of Inverness, and they're looking at a network model with Inverness. Yes. 
So uh, Dr. Degrees will have its own consultant-led maternity service, but some of the staff may work between local hospitals, plus local mums will be given the choice. So if you live in the forest area or the west end of Murray and you'd prefer to go to Rigmore, the idea is to give you that choice in the future. Fantastic, yeah. So, um, but there'll still be a, a, a consultant-led service at Dr. Gray's. So uh, I'll, I'll be keeping, you know, as much pressure on NHS Grampian to show they're actually implementing things now. So the next step is to recruit, get out there and recruit, as well as build the, 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 the infrastructure at Dr. Gray's. I wanted to bring up the antisocial behaviour that's happened in the area the last six months. I mean, the most infamous incident, um, which I know has been dealt with in that now, there was a video that went round on social media of a, a group of teenagers um, beating up a bus driver. Yeah, and Keith, um, yeah. yeah. Um, and there's also been incidents where I'm based in Lossie where people are stealing people's doorbells and um, it might be elderly people that have carers and can't hear them and, and so on and so forth. And at the start of the year, we've both seen... Uh, videos of um, teenagers going around and basically stamping on car windscreens, yeah. which obviously causes a lot of damage that people end up having to pay for insurance policies and no claims and whatnot. One thing that's been suggested, and I don't want to speculate, is this has kind of risen in line with the, the free bus pass for um, uh, younger people, which I want to like state straight away, I think is a great thing, especially yeah. for areas like this where a lot of opportunities are centralised in Elgin and that. If there is some kind of link of where people may be going from time to time to create trouble to go back, is there a way that that could be, I don't want to say policed, but is there a way that that could be, someone could be punished or banned from using it for a period of time? You know, some kind of consequence? Yeah, so the free bus pass has been hugely popular with young people and led to lots of benefits. The bus operator stagecoach do have the ability to remove the pass uh, for antisocial behaviour if they wish to do so. And I'm not sure it's the policy to do so, but they have the ability to do that if they wish, is my understanding. So I looked into this issue uh, when the incident happened that you mentioned. Uh, I think the real issue, of course, is why we have antisocial behaviour, irrespective of what tools people are using to, to be antisocial. Uh, and I don't pretend to have the answer to that because I think I'm sure it's quite a complex issue. Um, a lot of people say that, you know, COVID has exacerbated because young people are under lockdown and that's had, you know, an impact on their, their mental health or their just their, their behaviour. Um, and so it's, it's an impact in various different ways. Uh, but one of those is behaviour. And what we're seeing now is the outcome of that. But there needs to be a community response. I know a lot of people say the police, the police, the police, the police, the police. And yes, I've spoken to the police and the police are taking action. But you're not going to solve antisocial behaviour just by having, you know, the police dealing with it alone. It's got to be a partnership, community response. You know, first and foremost, families and parents, carers. The schools are now involved in trying to address this. So there is a partnership locally looking at this. Um, and, you know, I hope it makes progress. I think we'll find out in summer when the weather's good and people are out more. Yes. If antisocial behaviour continues to occur or increase, then we know we've still got a problem. Because obviously you would think it would be more likely to happen, the, weather, the weather's better and there's more people out and about. So yeah, I'm not a behavioural scientist, but you know I think people do say that things are slightly worse after COVID. We're not the only part of the country going through this. I speak to my parliamentary colleagues um, from all parts of the country and they're experiencing some of this as well. Um, and okay, you know, the bus pass is cited in Murray because people might use that to yeah. go from town to town, but it's also occurring in areas where people are not having to travel. You know, yeah. because, you know, in bigger, yeah. more urbanised areas. So, yeah, it's something that's got to be looked at and dealt with. I think, I mean, I, I don't want to, like, go too hard, because obviously part of growing up is making mistakes and then learning from it, but I suppose what people would argue is maybe the severity and the more sinister kind of crime that's kind of led from it, basically. But um, well, yeah. I think an important point to make is you mentioned more sinister crime. Often, uh, if not all the time, it's a very small, small number of yeah. people yeah. and it could even be the same families yeah, that are causing a lot of that crime. So the stats might be high, but it's a very small number of people causing uh, the majority of the crimes. Yeah. And the vast majority of young people are great, behaving responsibly. Yeah, 100%. So, yeah, 
I do know it's a very small number of people. If you speak to the police, they'll tell you it's a very, very small number of people. Often they know who it is who is causing a disproportionate amount of the antisocial behaviour. And I suppose like an unfortunate consequence of that is people then do kind of label like the entire young generation with that. And we all kind of have our own nostalgia of back in my day, like things weren't as easy then. But in reality, challenges for young people don't um, change. They just evolve into different things. So, yeah. yeah. Just kind of wrap up the last couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah, go. One, one, one more each. Um, so I suppose I'm just trying to end things on a more positive note, Richard. Um, I just I want to know, like, what's a typical working week for you? How, I, I know you're a very busy man, but I'm, I'm actually interested to know, like, how many hours do you work a week? You know, are you all over the place? How often are you home? Um, yeah, well, every week's different, and people ask me this quite a lot, and it's quite difficult to get a typical answer because I'm a minister and I'm an MSP, and of course, I've got my own personal life and my own life because I'm obsessed with various other things and out with politics. <laughs> uh, most lately, uh, well, most um, embarrass- embarrassingly Aberdeen Football Club. Oh, how's that going for <laughs> you at the moment? <laughs> Which, well, I, I don't know if you're Aberdeen supporters or who you support, but uh, uh, as an Aberdeen Football Club supporter, I've been a bit obsessed with that recently. Not in a good way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah, so generally what you try and achieve is Mondays and Fridays in the constituency, Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays, either in Parliament or on ministerial duties, because I quite often visit all over the country, you know, organisations and communities to do with my portfolio. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm in charge of employability schemes, for instance. I go and look at some of the employability schemes that are helping people with barriers, getting back into the labour market, and how the help we're giving them to get back into work is, is working. Um, you know, employment powers are reserved to the UK government, but in Scotland we do have the ability to create schemes to help break down barriers people with disabilities or, um, you know, just all different types of barriers. It could be single mums trying to get back to work, but they can't get um, access to childcare, transport, and we're trying to work out how to coordinate all that. So, yeah, that takes me all around Scotland, and I've got a, a responsibility for the Just Transition, which is about the journey towards our net zero targets of 2045, yeah. and Scotland will no longer be contributing towards climate change. And we have to manage that journey because it means creating new industries, new types of jobs, keeping people in jobs, and maybe carbonised uh, industries that have to be decarbonised. We have to make sure these people are still in jobs and that's all got to be managed and policies put in place and create new green jobs as well. So on a Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, I really should be in Parliament, but clearly as ministers, we go around the country in those days as well. And sometimes that happens on a Monday and Friday as well, and I'm not in the constituency and you're under pressure with your constituency diary, but you have to be away from home or away from Murray on, on ministerial business because as a minister of the government, you have to deal with your, your ministerial duties. So if something breaks in my area of responsibility, I have to deal with it. It's my job. We need a government. I'm part of the government. <laughs> and, you know, and that sometimes can lead to conflict between your constituency duties and your, your government duties. And at weekends, I go to community events um, and... Obviously, if an issue breaks in the constituency or, or even in terms of my ministerial responsibilities, at the weekend, I have to deal with it at the weekend. So there's quite a lot of media stuff to deal with at the weekends. Um, so that's how the week works. Hi. Monday, Friday, hopefully constituency. Weekends, constituency events. And Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, you know, in Parliament, answering questions from the opposition and MSPs. It's not just the opposition, it's the MSPs of all parties will ask me questions in my portfolios. I might be leading a debate for the part of the, for the government. So I, last week I opened and closed a debate on, um, what was the debate? It was on uh, workers' rights being under threat from uh, Brexit. Uh, so I opened and closed the debate on that in Parliament last week, so that was a parliamentary duty. So I had to be in Parliament for that. So it'd be fair to say no two weeks are the same? Yeah, no two weeks are the same. You could spend five days, one week on government business, uh, but of course then when it's recess, you're in your constituency, you're not at Parliament, so you could end up doing you know, four days constituency, one day ministerial, it just varies, as well as weekends, obviously, sometimes. Yeah. So uh, there's one or two things I could ask you to end off on. I'm going to leave seagulls because I feel like everyone's hands are tied with that, <laughs> and I'm, I'm kind of tired champion too. <laughs> but um, we had the a bunch of the guys oh. from the hunting, uh, Murray Huntington's disease charity. Now, these guys are great in campaigning for... Um, uh, the I don't want to say like illness, but the the thing that yeah yeah um, yeah uh, and 
one of the guys' uh, daughter has to be in a special accommodation, which is I think it's out in the Highlands. I think it's a hundred and I think it's thirty like, miles, yeah, hundred and thirty miles, hundred and thirty mile round journey. Now they're quite actively looking to try and see if they can get accommodation like that here, so they obviously don't have to travel as far uh, to see loved ones that um, that has been passed on to and, and whatnot. What do you what do you think could be done there to maybe accommodate something like that going forward? So I've been working with the Huntington's group in, in Murray, I think since we were formed a few years ago, and I've not met them for a few months, but I've met them a few times over the years, and I've looked into these issues. So we're doing our best still to try and get the NHS to work with them. Um, a lot of the groups we work with in Europe, uh, in Murray, sorry, uh, a lot of the groups are set up to support people with particular health conditions, and. You know, we always have to make sure we put the case for Murray to have its fair share of NHS resources to deal with these particular health conditions. But because they're so specialist, sometimes you're looking for, uh, you know, it can take some time to get specialist nurses to help those groups and, and the relatives and the families. Um, so that's one example of Huntington's, is where, as you rightly said, currently patients have to travel or people with the conditions quite far for accommodation and their loved ones would much rather that was closer to home. So it takes time, and obviously it's a case of building the case for that because it depends how many families are affected. Um, so I, I spend quite a lot of time speaking to NHS, trying to let get them to investigate the case for creating more resources locally. They will look at how many families are affected, they'll look at the cost of it. So sometimes it can take a few years. So that that's yeah, I'm very well aware of that, and that I, they're a good group. Yeah, yeah. and they're quite a new group. They've only been going for a few years. Yeah, one hundred percent. And the guys are relentless with the the campaigning that they do, and they're a, they're a great bunch of guys yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah and I also deal with their national associations. Mm -hmm. So I met their national representatives. Yeah, I think they're, they do they're a small organisation nationally. They've only got one person working for them on a Scottish basis, and I think they may even be part time. I'm not sure they're full time, but I met them in Parliament to discuss the Murray situation. Yeah. So. It's just, we just sometimes you have to bang on an issue. And, yeah. Yes. Um, keep at it, not give up. Mm -hmm. It takes quite a few years sometimes, but we've got there. I've I've got lots of issues I've been involved in. It's taken a few years to get there, <laughs> but we've got there, and uh, it's always it's always very re rewarding when you finally get there. Good things come to those who wait. Uh, well, I guess there's always left to say, Richard, is thank you very much for your time. Yeah, I know we've, we've kind of surprised it. you. We've turned up with a half an STV van mm -hmm. in your <laughs> office, but I, I guess I'm just to ask if you enjoyed it. I suppose. You're very professional. And I'm looking at all this gear around you and thinking, wow, it's not just a dictaphone. It was <laughs> it's, uh, the real deal here. So I'm really impressed. So keep up the good work. And uh, I will make a promise to listen to more of your podcast because they sound really intriguing. Um, I was lined up to be asked about music, football and books. We'll do that next time. <laughs> so maybe not the football. It's too depressing to speak about it now. When the next election comes round. Yeah. Thanks Richard. very much and thanks for having Thank me. Thank you.